Thank you, Jacob and Chris. It's awesome. Hey, good morning. Um, happy, uh, happy Super Bowl Sunday. Um, it came across uh, an amazing quote by a godly preacher who said, uh, I searched the scriptures for the Bengals and the Rams. Um, there are no mention of Bengals in the Bible. Rams are actually all over the place, and they usually get slaughtered. <laughs> so I think we're good. I, 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 think, it, I think it's going to be... I think it's going to be a good day. Who day? If you have a Bible, why don't you stand up with me? And uh, let me read God's word. Let the feasting begin and let it begin. Uh, let it begin with the word of God. I'm going to read Matthew chapter 20, verse 17 through 19 to start us out today. Here we go. Matthew 20, verse 17 through 19. A tender, um, emotional Incredible paragraph to launch where we're going to go. Here we go. And as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside. And on the way, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes. And they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. Lord Jesus, would you now um, do what only you can do? I pray, I pray that you would just take over this room. If there's any distractions in the name of Jesus, we pray that you would shield us from them. We pray that our hearts would be just tender, that our eyes would be open, that that we would see your truth and, and you would just light it up by the power of your Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that if there's anything um, within me that is of me, that you would let that um, just kind of fade away and burn off and that your powerful, life-changing, convicting, quickening truth would connect with our hearts in such a way that we are deeper in love with you and live lives more like you. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, amen. You may be seated. Well, from this paragraph, let me just go ahead and launch out and tell you that Jesus and his disciples were on a little journey. And if you caught this, they were going up to Jerusalem. In fact, it says twice in those opening sentences, they were going up. He took them and said, see, we are going up to Jerusalem and just... Can I just start with a little topography, geography of uh, Holy Land, Israel? Is that okay, everybody? Um, important that you know this. In, like, if you live in, like you do, if you live in Ohio, um, we'll often say things like, we're going up to Michigan, or we're going, I don't know, down to Tennessee, or something like that. But, but if you lived in Israel in that day and age, you would say up when you were talking about Jerusalem because whether you were coming from the north, south, east, or west, there was this mountain called Mount Zion and a plateau on top of Mount Zion where was built the city of Jerusalem. And almost from anywhere, as you were traveling, you could look up from a distance and you could see Jerusalem. You'd take this road up to Jerusalem. And in fact, in another sermon for another day, but, but at night when you were traveling, and you looked up on this mountain, and the city was lit up, you would even say, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. And you would travel up to Jerusalem. And this time, as they were traveling up to Jerusalem, you got to understand, from the perspective of the disciples, they were basically like, finally, we are going to the city. The game is about to start. Like, like game on, let's go. You see, um, uh, it's, it would be almost impossible to understate the importance of Jerusalem. Um, there, there's some countries in the world, America is not one of them. In America, we've got all these significant cities. But in Israel, profoundly, it is Jerusalem and everything else. It's almost like, you know, in England, you have London, or in, I don't know, in France, you have Paris. And, and profoundly, even exponentially above that, in Israel, there was Jerusalem lit up on top of this mountain, and everything of significance began in Jerusalem. The king and, and a kingdom that would be established would obviously begin and come out of Jerusalem. And to the disciples, they're basically like, okay, he's been traveling around like out in the country folk 
lands, talking about the kingdom, doing his healing and teaching, but soon, but soon, but soon, we're going to make our way to the city. He's going to kick all the dirty Romans out of our city. We will reign triumphant. He's going to establish his kingdom, and obviously, it's starting in Jerusalem. Game on. Let's go. On their way up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was like, yeah, we better clarify something. Um, in your text, uh, above this paragraph, it probably says something like the third time he predicts his death. Okay, so Jesus calls them over to the side of the road, kind of like, you know, the side of the highway, and he kind of huddles them up, and he's like, hey, guys, I need to clarify something. I know I said this once. I know I said it a second time, third time. We are going to Jerusalem, and this, in your mind, how you got to, like, kind of setting up your heart, it will not go well. This is what's about to go down when we get to Jerusalem. I will be taken. I will be falsely accused. I will be beaten. I will be spit upon. I will be whipped. I'll be flogged. I'll be nail-spiked to Roman wood, and I will, don't miss this, I will die on a garbage dump outside of the city. I am going to Jerusalem to be murdered, and three days later, I will rise from the grave. And the disciples, like, I, I don't understand this, but, but I can tell you profoundly, they did not get it, okay? They, they didn't get it the first two times. I don't think they understood or even remembered what was going on this time when he said it. I'll tell you something, we're going we're gonna to deal with this April 17th when we talk about it in Easter. This was not, like, supposed to be a surprise, all right? They knew what was coming, even though they just had no idea. They were just like, it's like they were not getting it. I don't know why, strangely, that gives me some comfort, because I know in my walk with the Lord, I'm often feeling like, I know, I'm still not getting it fully. They didn't get it. And one of the reasons I know how they didn't get it was because what happened next was the wrong thing to say at the wrong time. Okay? Following this, we have a very awkward moment, like someone with almost zero emotional intelligence enters that conversation, tender, hurting, repeated conversation. Guys, let me make it clear, I'm about to die. And a mama is going to say the wrong thing at the wrong time. Okay, so watch this. Look at what happens next. This is verses 20 through 24. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons. And kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom. Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? And they said to him, we are able. He said to them, you will drink my cup. But to sit at my right hand and my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. First word says then, meaning right then. Like right then when Jesus is like, we're going up to Jerusalem, I'm about to be beat up and murdered. Right then, this mom comes and says, Jesus, can I ask you something? Hey, I got my two boys. I got James and John. And when you do your throne, kingdom, leading, kind of reigning thing, can my two boys sit on your right and your left in the places of power? Can we do, can we do that, Jesus? And I think... I think Jesus would have been hurt. I think he would have been discouraged. I think he would have kind of put his head in his hands like, again, like, how, really, now? By the way, just kind of a side point so you, so you understand what's going on. Um, if you look at this text, in fact, can you go back to verse 20 a little bit? Look at this text. A woman, a mother, the sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus. Now, you need to know, some of you might not know this. I haven't known this for a lot of my life studying the Bible. But this woman, virtually every scholar says that this woman was Salome, okay? Salome, we find out in another text, 
Salome was the sister of Mary and the sons of Zebedee. Okay, sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee being James and John. Meaning, I don't know if you realize this, meaning Salome was Jesus' aunt and James and John were actually Jesus' cousins. Okay? So just to kind of dig beneath the surface a little bit more and to tell you what I really think was happening in this moment is that Salome kind of stepped up and was like, hey, Jesus, like, I know you're about to do this Jerusalem king reigning throne, establish the kingdom thing, but let's just point one thing out, Jesus. This is important. Just remember, she's your mom, but I'm your aunt, and James and John are your cousins. This wasn't random woman question. This was Aunt Salome, like, what, 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 are, what are you asking? She's like, let me, let me just clarify, Jesus. She's your mom. I'm your aunt. They're your cousins. And family should count for something. I mean, we are all followers, but we are your family. And when you establish this king reigning thrones, blah, 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 remember your cousins. They should at least be a bump up, Jesus, because family should count for something. Okay? I literally think that's exactly what she was saying. And Jesus was like, oh, you don't know what you're asking. And the other disciples, they hear this, and the text says they were indignant, not annoyed, not frustrated, not, not like slightly angry. They were indignant. I don't know what happens to cross over into, I don't really use that word that much, but indignant. Um, I think literally what was happening is you got 12 angry men here, okay? You got, you got frustration, prideful going on, and they are about to throw down on their little path to Jerusalem. And so Jesus pulls them aside and is like, okay, it's time for a conversation, all right? And in this conversation, in the response of Jesus, we are going to see Jesus have a conversation about leadership and honor and esteem and very specifically about greatness. Jesus is going to talk about what is great in the eyes of his father, okay? And that's what we're going to learn about for the rest of the morning, okay? So, so as we go through this text, which we're about to go through this and, and Jesus' response after this, we're going to ask two questions, which, by the way, these are two very awesome, healthy, biblical lens questions that I would love for you to ask whenever you approach God's word, okay? Here's the first question. What does this reveal about the Lord? Second question, what does this reveal about me? And by the way, anytime you go after God's word, like I would make a little pastor's heart happy, like first question to ask is not, what does this say about me? What should I do? What's the first question is really a healthy, good, awesome Bible question. God, what does your word say about you, your character, your heart, your desire, your will, your motives? And when I learn about you, it has a way of just shaping everything about me. When I connect my identity to your identity, God, it has a way of straightening me out and making it less about me and more about you. Start with what does this say about God, then move to and what would you have me do? How would you have me live? That make sense? So we're going to ask those two questions. And then before we're done, there's going to be these two kind of application questions that I'm going to ask you to write down and grip onto because they will be two questions that I think will help, um, help you navigate the kind of life that God wants you to live as you walk with him and seek to display him to others. Okay? Is everybody with me? Two questions and then two kind of application questions. And then we'll be done and we'll let the Super Bowl feast begin. First question, what does this reveal about God? Verse 20 through 28. Let me read the whole text. I want you to hear this, hear the response. And I want you to look through the lens of what is this saying about God. Then the mothers of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons. And kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand, one at your left, in your kingdom. Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, we are able. He said to them, you will drink from my cup. 
But to sit at my right hand and my left is not mine to grant, but it's for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. When the ten heard this, they were indignant at the two brothers. Now listen to this. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. What does this show us about God? What does this show us about Jesus and why he came and what was his heart and what were his motives? What does it show us? If you're taking notes under that first big question, what does this show us about God? I want you to write this down. He came to suffer. He came to save. He came to serve. Okay? He came to suffer. He came to save. He came to serve. Let's go after this. He came to suffer. Look back at verse, uh, look back at verse uh, like 22, 23, somewhere in there. We see all this lingo about cup. He's like, hey, you know what you're asking? Can you drink this cup? Okay, you will drink this cup, but it's not like, why all the stuff about cup? Okay, if, if you're um, not all that familiar with the metaphors of the Old Testament, um, a cup is a significant metaphor. To drink a cup means um, it's usually associated throughout the Old Testament with judgment, wrath, and ultimately suffering. It usually has something to do with consequences. So, for example, like if you, if you stole an ox or if you killed a man or if you, you know, violated the Sabbath or whatever, you would drink the cup, meaning the consequences, the punishment, the, the, the suffering that goes along with what you did, okay? And so Jesus was ultimately saying, by the way, this is like big picture What's the story of Jesus? What's this all about? Why did he come? He said, I have come to drink a cup. And what is the cup that he's drinking? Let me just tell you my own life, ready? You know this. I'm so far from a, like a, a perfect holy man. Like, like if we were to put up on the screen every sin I've ever done, every Every lie, every prideful thing, every word, every thought, every deed, every, everything I've ever done, you would look up at that and say, what, you call yourself a pastor? Look at your life, look at, look at everything you've ever done. And this is what Jesus has done for me. Watch this, I love this. Every sin of David Newman, every attitude, action, thought, deed, he's saying, as if that were all swirled up in one big cup, and here's why I came, to take the consequences, punishment. I'm drinking the cup that, to take and suffer what you deserved. I'm drinking your cup. And Jesus is saying, I'm doing that for the sins of the entire world. Every, every person who's ever lived throughout all of history, I've come to suffer Remember, disciples, like the conversation we just had on the side of the road? Of course you don't remember it. You were thinking about something else. Listen, I've come to be whipped and beaten and mocked and spit upon and ultimately to die. And in my death, I am suffering. I've come to suffer. I've come to drink the cup. I've come to, I've come to, I've come to suffer. Are you able to drink that cup? And James and John are like, Yes, and Jesus like, well, no, well, actually, kind of, if you know their story. They did share in the suffering. James, Acts chapter 12, was beheaded by Herod. Do you remember that story? You go through all the disciples, Bartholomew was flayed alive. James was thrown off the temple and, and killed with clubs in Jerusalem. Uh, Peter was crucified upside down. John, James, this James was beheaded, John. Um, John, many of you know he wrote Revelation on the island of Patmos, but many of you don't know that before that there was this evil emperor, Domitian. Okay, and Domitian gathered John and was like, we're going to shut up John. What should we do? Let's torture him and kill him, and here's how we're going to do it. I'm sorry for the graphic nature of this. Let's boil him alive in hot oil in that cauldron. They made a big fire, took a cauldron of hot oil, 
boiled him alive, threw him in there, and in some kind of, I don't know, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego moment, I don't even know what happened, but for some reason, he didn't die. His skin was not burned, and he jumps out of the cauldron, and they're like, what? We can't kill him? How about we exile him? And they throw him, you know, Robinson Crusoe, Tom Hanks in the volleyball style, whatever, like on an island to rot and die on Patmos, and he suffered in a long, slow, lonely suffering. So Jesus was like, yeah, you will share of my suffering. However, I've come to suffer, and my suffering is going to accomplish something else. And if you're not that familiar with Christianity, if you're not that familiar with the beautiful story of God, this one will blow your mind. So watch this, verse 28, watch what he says. Not only is he here to suffer, but he's here to save. Watch this. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I love this. One scholar said that phrase might be the most profound phrase in the Bible. To give his life as a ransom. If you're taking notes, ransom is the Greek word lutron, okay? L-U-T-R-O-N in English transliteration. A lutron, and, and here's what it means. Here's what a ransom means. Here's the definition. The price paid to set one free. It's the price of freedom. So in you know, modern lingo, if somebody's kidnapped or someone's held hostage by terrorists or whatever, and they're like, we want a ransom. What does that mean? It means if you pay this price, we'll set you free. If you pay this price, it will be a price that will release from bondage and captivity. And in the ancient world, this, world, this word lutron was used all the time. Um, I refer you, if you want to read more of it, uh, Leon Morris wrote this book called The Apostolic Teaching of the Cross. Okay? And it talks about this word ransom, and here's what it means. Ready? It was often used in slavery lingo. In the Roman world, there were slaves everywhere. If you were a slave, you did not own your life. You were in bondage. You were in captivity. You had no will of your own. You had one hope if someone paid a ransom. If someone paid the price to set you free, you are released from bondage to freedom, from captivity to freedom. Your identity changed and you are set free. Second context. It was used in the lingo for prisoners of war. Rome would go out and they would conquer everybody. And they would go out and they would take all these prisoners of war. And here's what they would do. They would bring them back and throw them in these hole-in-the-ground dungeons. And the census of the day of Rome, I'm sorry for all this History Channel stuff, census of the day in Rome is that when you are thrown in a dungeon to rot and die, you are not considered alive. You are not on a census. You are considered a dead man. But there was one thing that switched the sentence and gave you life again. If someone from your own country traveled, paid a ransom, and the ransom price set you free and you went from death to life, from slave to free, from death to life. And Jesus is saying, please don't miss this. If you're going to miss everything, don't miss this. Here's what he's saying. Do you want to know why I came to this earth? It's not to be a good moral teacher. It's not to give you good little examples of live like Jesus and that's it. It's not to be a philosopher. It's not to be like a hyped up Gandhi or Buddha or whoever else you might say is a really good person that you might follow that life example and live a happy life. Here's what Jesus said. He's like, guys, let me make this clear. We're on the way to Jerusalem. I will suffer, and I am dying to give my life as a ransom for you. The people of this earth are in bondage. I've come to set them free. The people of this earth are dead in captivity. I've come to give them life. I will pay with my blood on the cross, and the gospel is that Jesus is the Lutron ransom that sets the captives free. Free. That's why that old hymn says, Long my imprisoned spirit lay fast bound in sin and nature's night. Mine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My eyes were free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Amazing love, how can it be? That thou, my God, should die for me. He died to pay a ransom to set you free. And for anyone that says, Jesus, I want to follow you as my Savior and my Lord. I want to know you. I want to follow you. I want to be transformed by you. Jesus is like, well, a ransom has been paid for you in my blood. And I'm bought your freedom. You are my son or my daughter. And you will be transformed. 
He came to suffer. He came to save. Final one. He came to serve. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit, but just so that you know and grip onto this. That Jesus said, I have come. Even though, like, I'm, I'm the king of the world and the highest being in the universe, I have come to actually serve. And some of you are going to have a hard time wrapping your brain around this one. I've come to serve you. And so many of you know this, but what happens next in this story is that they go to Jerusalem and as they get to Jerusalem, Jesus, among other things, says, hey, I want to have a final meal with my disciples. Okay? So he goes up to this upper room. You remember how the story shook out? I was re- first of all, I was reminded of this this last week. I'd forgotten about this. But Luke tells us that, first of all, as they're having that little dinner in the upper room before communion and everything, want to know what happens first? A fight breaks out amongst the disciples on who is the greatest. Now let that hit you for a moment. Like they're, they're having a fight on the way to Jerusalem. They're having a fight at the table. It's like, we're going to do this again? Like We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do this again? I don't know if that gives you comfort or if that gives you sorrow. It, it, it's a strange mixture of both for me. Okay. But then do you remember what Jesus did? took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, got down on his knees and took the position of the lowest slave in the house. He began to wash their feet. He began to serve them. He began to wash their dirty, grimy, ancient world road-infested feet. And the people were stunned and he was like, that's what I've come to do. I've actually come to be a suffering servant. Okay, I've come to serve. What does it teach us about God? came to serve. Okay. So I'm going to transition then. If that's what it's teaching us about God, um, what does it teach us about us? Okay, like, like Jesus came not only to suffer, serve, save us, but he's given us a model and he's going to like flip the script of all logic of this world. And he's going to ask us to live like he's lived. He's going to empower us to live in such a way that makes the Lord smile when he sees a life that we live. And so watch this. Um, uh, Auntie Salome says, um, hey, can your cousin sit on your left and right? And watch what he's going to do. Okay. Watch what he's going to do. Let's look at verses 25 through 28. He's going to define true greatness. Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Okay, so here's what Jesus says. He's like, let me tell you how the world works then and how the world works now. You know this, but here's what Jesus says. He says, the way the world works, the way the Gentiles work, is to ascend this ladder of greatness, right? More notoriety, right? More higher on the ladder food chain, right? And when they do, here's what the lords of the Gentiles do. Here's how the world operates. As you get higher, people serve you. As you go higher, ascend to greatness, you can have people that kind of do the dirty work, do the things that you don't want to do. They kind of serve you and take their energy and their ideas and their, you know, whatever they have to lift you up. And they lord it over the people underneath them. And Jesus looks at them and says, not so among you. I'm going to flip the script on what is greatness. I'm going to redefine what is precious in God's eyes. I don't want you to think that greatness is ascending a ladder so that others serve you. I actually want you to live a Jesus-like life 
where greatness is found as you serve others. Greatness is found as you look to model the life of Jesus, to care for others, to wash others' feet, to, to serve others, to put their needs before your own. And in that process of doing that, God has a way of saying, I will empower that. I will light that up. And amazing things for my kingdom will happen when you actually choose to serve. Okay, so this is what, this is the process of life that I'm going to ask you to consider doing. Okay? When you wake up in the morning to look up to the Lord and to say, God, I know that you're working I know that your heart is being unfolded all around me. I know that there's things that you want me to do. God, would you allow me to live a life today where I'm sensitive to you, hearing from you, empowered by you to live a Jesus-like life in those around me? And that leads to a question that God is already doing. He's already working in this question, okay? And I want you to write this question down, if you would, because I want it to be, remember I said there's two questions that are going to be like application questions. Here's the first question, okay? A look to Jesus, hear from Jesus, tender to Jesus, and ask this question, how can I serve others? How can I serve? How can I, how can I serve others? Okay? So here's what I would love for you to do. And the way to work, be like, God, would you allow me to see, hear, and respond to ways that you're working and to serve other people? Um, it means, and you might want to switch that wording around, but it means, and I want you to try this. I literally want you to try this in your workplace. It's a workplace where if your workplace is kind of like normal stats out there, people are like, hey, how are you doing? I'm busy. There's so much on my plate. I've got all these objectives. These are all the things to do. You want to know what will blow their mind if you actually look at them and say, hey, is there anything I can do to help you? Um, I have 30 minutes unplanned, like extra margin. Can I take any of my time, like my energy, any gifts or strengths that I have, and use it to help you succeed? Like, can I serve you? Can I help you? Again, not just in your own strength, not just check the box, you're a good Christian if you're really good in serving others. No, God, what would you have me do? And would you empower this process of me looking to help others, love others, serve others? And if you do, I think the Lord will meet you in that. And there'll be a certain kingdom greatness that's revealed. In your family, I don't know if you're six years old or 20 years old or 79 years old, however old you are, I think the Lord would want you to serve your spouse, serve your parents, serve your siblings. Look for ways to say, like, how can I lift others up? How can I show the love of Jesus to other people? Um, I've been, I've been doing this thing where, or in the morning, actually, as I drive to, as I drive and as I take walks in the woods and pray to the Lord, saying, God, would you just impress upon my heart anybody that you would have me pray for and even reach out to to ask the question, how can I, can I do anything to help you? Can I do anything to serve you? Can I do anything in my like gifts or strengths to kind of lift you up? Okay. So that's the first question. Would you write that down? Would you make it part of your life? Put it in your own words or whatever. But if you will, I think the Lord will open this up, daily opportunities for you to say, how can I serve? How can I do little things to help and serve and love you? Okay, now everybody look up at me. For some of you, your issue is not, how can I serve others, help others, care for others? Okay. Your help, your issue is not how can you serve, but relating to a God who wants to serve you. Okay? Jesus said, I have come to serve, and he wants to empower you, indwell you, help you, and serve you. Okay, so so let me illustrate it like this, and then I'll tell you where I'm going with this. Um a couple years ago, I was eating uh, lunch with this wise, godly, spirit-filled man at Chick-fil-A. 
okay? He was eating his chicken sandwich, and I was eating my chicken sandwich with Chick-fil-A sauce, multigrain bun. <laughs> and he looked me in the eyes and he said, David, what do you need from God today? And what are you asking the Lord for today? And my first impulse of how to react was how some of you in this room react. I know because I love you. I'm friends with some people in this room that react exactly like this. If somebody in their life says, uh, hey, I know you're going through a hard time. Do you need anything, man? The response is, no, nah, man, I'm good. I don't need anything. Hey, if something comes up, like, I'll reach out for help, but I'm good. Translated, I'm self-reliant. Translated, I can do this on my own. Translated, I can live life on my own strength. And sometimes the way we relate to God in this slightly, subtly, arrogant, self-reliant, do it in our own strength, is to have the type of response where, hey, God, do you need... No, God, I'm, I'm good. If I need anything, I'll reach out. Otherwise, I'll live life on my own strength. Jesus was washing the feet of all the disciples, went to each of them, got to Peter, and he was like, Peter, I'm ready to wash your feet. And Peter was like, no way, you're not washing my feet. And Jesus is like, if you don't let me wash your feet, we have no part of each other. You remember what Peter did? It's like, okay then, why don't you go ahead and wash my head, body, everything. Like, you can serve me, Jesus. And Jesus wants to walk with you. He wants to empower you. He wants to manifest his gifts of the Spirit through you. He wants to strengthen you. He wants to help you. He doesn't want you to do life on your own strength. And that's why a second question that I want you to like think about and ponder every single day is, is what do I need from God today? What am I asking the Lord for today? Sometimes I'm asking him for patience because I know that I don't have the patience to make it through the day. Sometimes I'm asking him for wisdom. Sometimes I'm asking him for very specific provision. But he came to serve and he wants to serve you. He wants you to serve. He wants to serve you. Jesus says, I've come to serve, and then I just love how Matthew rolls this out. And this will be the last thing that we'll look at, and then I'm done. But in the next text, Matthew, Matthew 20, verse 29 and following, he says that he's come to serve, and then he just gives us this beautiful example for what like, life should look like. And I want you to hear this simple little story. I'm not going to say much about it, but I want you to place yourself in the story. Watch this. And as they went out of Jericho, a great crowd followed him. And behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent. But they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And stopping, Jesus called out to them and said, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. You want to know what Jesus did? He served him. Just quickly, these people were willing to say, Jesus is the Christ, he's the son of David, he's the king of the universe, and he's here to serve, and they were willing to ask him for something very specific. And Jesus responded in ways that only he can do. And so here's, here's my loving pastoral encouragement for you, okay? Wrapping this thing up, ready? There was a day where Jesus and the disciples were on the road to Jerusalem. They're having a little cat fight about greatness. Who's the greatest? Who's the greatest? Who's sitting left and right on the thrones? Who gets to be in charge? Who gets to have authority, honor, esteem? Jesus Brings him over to the side of the road. And he's like, I'm flipping the script on everything in the world. You want to know what I came to do? Suffer, save, and serve. And I'm asking you to walk with me, be empowered by me, and live a life with me in such a way that you're looking to serve others as you're being served by me. And Jesus says, that's greatness. That's greatness. Let me pray for us. Lord, we love you. We come to you. We need you. Thank you for being the one who died to pay the Lutron to set us free. 
And I pray, Lord, that, that you would teach us what this looks like to listen to you and to serve others. And I pray, Father, that we would have the humility to receive what only you can give, the serving nature of a king that says, I love you and I want to serve you. And so would you do that in us, Jesus? We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. We'd like to close this service with communion and worship. Um, so communion, the night before Jesus was crucified, after that little fight in that upper room, after he washed their feet, Jesus picked up a cup. By the way, I hope this like changes things a little bit for you, even from what I've just taught. He says, this is a cup. This is a cup of the brand new covenant. What does he mean by that? Like there is a cup of, of judgment, wrath, thing, but this is the cup and I'm drinking of this cup. Okay? And he's like, I want you to drink this cup in remembrance of me, that my blood was shed for you. And then he took uh, bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. If you're a follower of Jesus, you take these elements to remember him. Look at me, for some of you in this room, you're saying, I, I don't know if I even understand this. I thought that like being religious was just like being a good person. Listen, he came for you. He died for you. He loves you. He wants you to know him. You can li give your life to Jesus. All you have to say is, Lord, I need you. Forgive me. I want to follow you. I want to be your son or your daughter comes running after you to transform you. You can do that this morning. You can do that in your chair. Cry out to God and give your life to Him. He'll transform you. Then I ask you to spend some time with the Lord if you're here this morning and you and God is like, like speaking to your heart. Spend some time with Him. Take communion as a means of remembering Him. Um, and then we'll stand and we'll sing of his worthiness. When the moment's right, take communion. If you didn't get it, there's elements in the back there or outside. And uh, then we'll stand and we'll worship the one who is worthy.